Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Jay's. I'm an alcoholic. Let me get this thing situated. Because this stuff is important, because when I fly, I um, download meetings and listen to them. So, yeah, I think it's important. This podcast, our lifesavers on that plane. Okay, um, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Jay's, and um, I just celebrated a birthday. I got sober March 15, 2003, you guys. So, um, is that 16 years? I think that's 16 years. I haven't picked up my chip yet. I don't actually know what I'm going to say. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be honest, you know, how they taught me. And, uh, the thing about this is, um, it's a miracle that I get to be up here and be doing this service work. Uh, because I didn't know what service was until I got here. I had no idea what service was, and now um, I have a pretty good understanding of what it is, and I don't get to do it just in uh, these rooms and for you and AA. I get to, uh, I have a good understanding of what it is, how it makes me feel, and I get to do that in the outside world as well, and um, that is such a gift of this program. So for me, um, I'm, I'm like, I can't do complex things. I, I have to break things down and be very simple. I'm very, um, you know, I, you know, I'm, I, I need schedule. The 12 steps is amazing. That's perfect for me. Direction. I need that. I need the book. I need all that. So I'm just going to follow the script, right? So you guys want me to tell you, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now, right? So um, for me, I think I don't have, I don't remember a whole lot of um, drunk stories, um, but I do think they're um, entertaining and uh, necessary still. Um, I don't think drunkologues are necessary, but I do think us talking about, or me, I should say, talking about my drinking is necessary um, because the meeting, what I was told when I first got here is this, this is actually for the newcomers, and so, um, you know, when you get into like PhD AA and you're talking about 10 step work and 11 step work, sometimes that doesn't resonate for people who are just freshly sober. And, um, you know, if nothing else, they can resonate with how unmanageable their lives are or how un- unmanageability has affected people's lives. So, um, certainly that unmanageability is a part of my story. So, um, for me, I just, I just, I just, um, since I could remember, and I didn't even know what time I started, but anyway, since I could remember, I, um, I had a lot of shame in my life. I was like a boy acting girl, whatever that stuff was weird. You know, I was also like, there's like some gay stuff mixed in there. We're sure not clear on, we're still not clear on what all that means. You know, um, there's some like a, addict stuff in my family background. My mom committed suicide when I was 10. Like I had like some serious shame, um, growing up and to kind of calm that down, I drank and that helped me. Um, that helped me because I stopped thinking about that shame and I stopped thinking about whether you would like me based on all that stuff or because of all that stuff. And I just got to be, and that worked for me for like, However long it worked, like I got to be a part of because I never felt a part of. So alcohol really helped me. Um, awesome. Five minutes. And so um, it it got to a but it but I but I'm an addict and I did it addictively. And what ended up happening is, um, you know, you know, debauchery bar brawls and spitting in people's faces and crash cars and broken relationships and all the stuff that we talk about. Right. So that happened to me. And, um, I really got sick of feeling bad about myself. I just got, I was just like, I've done this my whole life and I feel like alcohol is this symptom. And so, um, You know, to kind of just fast forward, some miraculous things happened where people came into my life at precisely the perfect time, and they put their arms around me, 
couple of people at the same time, and they said, when I feel the way you do, they didn't, I, how do you know how I feel? But when, you, when I feel the way you do, I take myself to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And there were a couple people in my life at the same time telling me this, and it's like, fine, I'll just, like, whatever. It wasn't like, I'll just go, but it was like, come on, go, go, go. So, you know, I, I walked through the doors, and um, when I, it, it was not easy I will tell you, it was not easy. I did not want to be here. But when I walked through the doors, um, what you told me is that this program was really, it, 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 it wasn't easy, but it was simple. There were simple steps, and that, that, that helped me. And the other thing, and I say this all the time, it's just my story. It's just like I'm sensitive. I'm a sensitive flower up here. So you told me that um, you would love me until I could love myself, that I hated it, but I loved it. And, like, I hated all those slogans, like, first things first and all that, but I loved it, right? And I didn't want to touch you, but I wanted you to touch me. And, like, that stuff really worked for me. And um, I got a sponsor uh, after, you know, I don't suggest it. This is just my story. But I got a sponsor after, uh, I think, being here a year. A year. I came to meetings, and I didn't like you guys, and I thought you were dramatic and all that stuff, but I got a sponsor, and he took me through the 12 steps, and what he told me is that I would be amazed before I was halfway through, and um, that the promises were going to come true in my life, and that and that 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 happened, and if you read the promises, like, they're, to me, to me, if I read the promises, like, those are, those are amazing set of sentences, and to believe that those could happen in my life were, it, it was like, I wanted that so bad. Like I wanted to not drink, but really I just wanted to feel better, you guys, so bad. And so um, the thing that I really, one of the promises that I really loved is that I would um, lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in people. And that's part of like service, right? Like service like gives you this, you know, you start losing this selfish identity, like this doing things selfishly. And like you start gaining interest and in, in feeling really good about yourself by helping people. And, um, you know, all the promises have come true. Um, I'm just kind of crash coursing fast for, you know, fast forwarding. All the promises have come true, but it, but it, but it hasn't, it, it, it's not easy work, but it's so simple. Don't make it complex. I have to tell myself all the time, don't make it complex. That's my disease wanting to talk to me about like, you know, can I go back out? Oh my God, you were, you know, whatever it was, whatever it is, you know, like you could probably make out with a lot more people if you drank or you were 29 when you got sober. Do you, do you really think you're, you know, all that my disease will come or, or like, I can't quite grasp that step. Mm, that's my disease talking to me. This stuff is really simple. My life is unmanageable. Um, you got, I've been told that I can't fix it, but a higher power can fix it. Um, I then reach out one minute. I then reach out to someone who has worked the program and has some experience and I tell them the reasons why I drank and there's a bunch of them, right? And there's a whole history of them. And then, um, they, you know, help me to pray my way through those reasons and then I get to go and apologize to people I hurt because of those reasons. And then I get to do that on an everyday basis. And then what I get to do is I get to share that with other people in the program. And um, that's flipping it, you guys. And I don't drink. And that's <laughs> kind of amazing. I mean, that is like you come in, you don't drink, you work the steps, you find you find a sponsor, you work the steps, you find a sponsor, you work, you take them through the steps and you keep showing up. And that's the service, the way that it's been explained to me. I'm done. I'm out. But, um, I'm really... You could have a minute of mine. <laughs> uh, I'm just, you know what? I'm just really, it's, it's just a gift and an honor. And I'm so grateful to be here. So thanks for listening. Elizabeth Alcolic. Elizabeth. I have to move when I talk. Uh, hey, it's nice to be here. Thanks, Jace. I um, I love that you took us through all the steps in like one minute. I thought that was amazing. And there's some paragraphs in the book like that, and it's just amazing how much we can pack in in, in just a short period of time. So it's um, really nice to be here. I want to thank Cassie, who's not here, for inviting me to come speak. And then she sent me a text. like She, she called me up. She gave me two days. She's like, hey, do you want to speak on this date or this date? And I said, oh, I'll pick this date. 
which is today, because it's my natal birthday today. And I thought, what a great thing. Like, I got the gift of coming to a new meeting about Parks Anonymous and sharing my story on my natal birthday. And then I even get friends who show up for dinner and to come hear me, even though they've heard my story before. So thank you, Tribe, for being here to support me. And, um, and I celebrated an AA birthday this month on March 6th. I celebrated 37 years of sobriety, and so March is a great month for birthdays. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's been, I like, I have had the privilege of growing up in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it truly has been a privilege. Um, I came, you know, I, I picked up a drink when I was 13 years old. I, like Jace, had a lot of shame about who I was. Um, the teachers were telling my parents that I had no self-esteem. My parents were divorced. I mean, my, my childhood wasn't particularly bad. It's the way I internalized it. And, um, and I felt less than, and I would hide behind my hair, and I felt ugly, and I didn't feel smart, and I didn't feel funny. And when I was 13 years old, I went to a party um, with some of my girlfriends at the time. We were babysitting, and uh, we drank. And I picked up a drink. I ended up in a blackout. I woke up the next morning face down on my closet floor with vomit everywhere. And you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to do it again. I wanted to do it again because it took me away from me. I wanted to do it again because I thought for one minute that I, like, hit this happy place. And I chased my whole rest of my drinking. I chased that happy place. You know how we keep chasing it? Like, oh, I'll add this pill and that powder and this substance and this liquid and I'll get to that happy place. I never friggin' found that happy place. Like, well, I just, like, zoomed through it. Like, it was, like, blank, happy, and then we zoom, you know? And then we're, and I would get sick a lot. Like, I got sick a lot when I drank because I drank too much. So, you know, then I would, like, go to, I, I, um, I did lewds because I'm like, oh, I won't get sick if I do lewds. You know, I'm going to switch and do this and do that. And, um, and that's the way drinking was for me. And, um, I, you know, so when I was, when I was a teenager, my parents were divorced and I had a real hard time with my mom because, you know, I guess I was a teenager. I hated everything about my mom. So I went, I convinced my, um, my dad and my grandmother and they sent me to this boarding school when I was 16 years old. And, you know, and I walked in and everyone was different than me because they had a, a lot of money and I didn't come from that. And, um, but what I got was I got this experience of like getting on planes and going to New York city. And we walked into this disc, you know, I'm, I'm 58 years old today. We walked into a disco called Studio 54, and we walked in, and I thought, we were 16 years old because the drinking age was 18. So we pull up in my friend's limo, and it's a private limo, so they, like, let us right in, and I felt like, wow, I'm so cool. We walk in, and it was the lights, camera, action. I thought, wow, this is it. Like, I want to grow up. I want to go to Studio 54. I want to live in New York City. I want to do all the drugs in the, you know, the back rooms. I want to go to the Hamptons in the summer. Like, I had my whole life planned, and it didn't really work out like that. Um, I, ma <laughs> I managed to graduate from high school. I went to college. Um, my first year in college, I, it, it, like, I, it wasn't really working for me, and I decided to go into business, so I sold speed. And, um, and I sold speed, I'm in business, and then I figured out, hey, there's not enough markup on this, I'm going to sell quaaludes. So my second year of college, I started selling quaaludes. And then I decided to major my first year in college in art history. Because see, in art history, you go into a room like this, they turn off the lights, they, in my day and age, they put a projector on and you look at art. Like, they would show you, like, pictures of art and, like, wow, like, what do you see in this piece of art? So, like, we could get high, we, I could go to class, I could look at the art, and then I would go home. And, you know, that didn't last for very long. My, my sophomore year, I was failing out of school. I was selling quaaludes. I found a boyfriend. I found a bad boy boyfriend. Um, he was someone that um, turned tricks for a living with men. He started living with me. He um, he grew up in juvie. I like I I met him selling drugs to him. He was living with me five days later. I called the cops on him two days after that. Kicked him, you know, kicked him down the stairs. Called the cops. He went to rehab and moved back in with me. And so that was like so so you know because that's I, I you know that's what we like. We like action drama. So I lived with a bad boy boyfriend um, my like last year and a half of drinking and um. And he was, you know, he was, he was turning tricks to, to, as a living. And, um, and I thought, God, you know, uh, like I'm a rescuer too. I have a little problem. I like to rescue. I call them angels with broken wings. And so he was my angel with broken wings. Cause I like really saw the beautiful person in him. And, um, 
And so I thought, well, you know, this is like he's in a better business. You know, I'm selling lewds, but like, hey, you know, maybe his line of business is better. So I started doing. So see, I started doing his line of business. I thought, yeah, I want to be like, I want to be a prostitute, and I want to make a lot of money. So think about it. Like, I go to high school, and I want to go to a good college. I go to, you know, and then I'm in high school, and, and I want to go to good college. Then I go to the bar, and I like want to live in the bars. And then I go to college, and I want to become a prostitute. And I'm drinking and drugging the whole time. Like, this is what alcohol and drugs do to our dreams. They, 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 they change them completely. My dreams changed completely. My world got really small. And, this, and I started to aspire to be a prostitute. And then I, you know, and then I did it for a while. I have to tell you, I'm not very, <laughs> not the best line of work for me, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so there I am, like, and, and, you know, and then I'm getting in, in debt to the drug dealers, and so when my boyfriend would be at rehab, I would be at home, I would hear knocks on the back door, and I would, you know, like the refrigerator, and I would like squeeze in this skinny little place in between the refrigerator and the wall because I knew they were coming in. And, you know, one day they came in, like six of them, and they had a gun. And I'm like sitting there in the, the bed, and I'm like, and they're, you know, hustling me up because I owed a lot of money because my boyfriend would like OD on my drugs all the time that I was trying to sell to get out of debt. So this is the cycle. Like, and we keep thinking, oh, it's going to get different. And, oh, I'm going to do something different. And, you know, and I keep doing the same thing, and I kept getting into more and more and more trouble. And um, and so what happened was my boyfriend's brothers were in Alcoholics Anonymous, so we started, they, he would go to rehab, he would come out, and then they started showing up on our door to take him to AA. So I started going to AA meetings with him. And, um, and people would come up to me, I'd be like, he's the one with the problem. They're like, that's okay, honey, keep coming back. <laughs> I don't have a problem, he has a problem. That's okay, keep coming back. And so my final year of drinking and drugging, I spent coming to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings periodically. And I would come, and then we would leave, Eddie and I would leave, and we would go get high, and then we would. he would go to rehab, he would come out, and we would end up back in AA. And... Um, and so what happened was, after about a year, we, you know, we were getting evicted, there was no more money, we were out there asking people, hey, can I have a dime to make a phone call, and we put all the dimes together just to try to buy, like, something to eat. And, um, and he ended up going to treatment one last time, and he was going to the uh, Salvation Army, because his insurance had run out. And I remember very clearly, he came in, and he's like, I can't do it anymore, I'm, I'm going to the Salvation Army. And... There was a moment, and I and I, we all have these moments where, um, in that moment, Eddie wasn't speaking to me, but some uh, a power greater than myself was. And through his eyes, I saw and I felt that it was over. I felt that this was like the last time, like we weren't going to be able to do it anymore. So he went to treatment, and the next day I went to the Charles River Group in Monday night meeting in Boston where I got sober, and I went to my friend Punk Paul, who was like punked out, spikes, you know, leather, the hair, the whole deal, and I said, hey. I need a rest. He's like, are you an alcoholic? I said, I'm not an alcoholic yet, but I need a rest. I can't do this anymore. And so um, he said, well, I'm going to pick you up tomorrow. We're going to take you to treatment center. And, um, and I tried to get drugs that night, and I, like, I couldn't do it. Like, I kept trying. I wanted to get loaded one last time. I couldn't do it. They took me. They picked me up on Tuesday morning. They drove me to New Hampshire. I went to a treatment center. And on Thursday, sometime on Thursday, I, I like, came to and I, I was walking down the hall in the middle of the night, and I couldn't figure out where I was, and the guard kind of told me what, what had happened, that I had been in treatment for two days, like, de like crazy detoxing. And, um, and I stayed at this treatment center for 30 days. It was called Beach Hill in New Hampshire. It was like, well, you know, it was my first one. So, like, it had, you know, tennis courts and a pottery studio and all that shit. My mom still has, I mean, it's crazy. Like, I, my mom's 85 years old, and I go to her house, and she still has this, um, this like, stained glass thing <laughs> that I made at the treatment center, you know, the therapeutic, like, let's do something crafty. So, my mom still has it. To, you know, she has it. I don't think she, like, remembers where, where it came from, but I do, and I see it all the time. I'm like, <laughs> That's from the treatment center. But, you know, I'm really grateful. I've not had to pick up a drink since that treatment center. So I got out, and I went into this halfway house. And um, and it was called the Fells Way Inn, right? You know, they gave it a fancy name. They put us on welfare. They said, you're not capable of doing anything but going to two meetings a day. And you have to wake up and do your chores and come to the house meetings and, like, do your chores, go, go to the house meeting, go to an AA meeting, come back, do some more stuff go to another AA meeting, come back, check in at a certain time, and, like, do it all tomorrow. And so that was what I did for my first six months of sobriety. 
And um, and in Boston, you um, when you go to the groups, there a lot of them are speaker meetings like this at night. And the thing is, like, you join a group, and then at 90 days, they, like, push you up, and you do your first 10-minute talk. And then <laughs> your group goes, and they do the, they're the speakers for other groups, like, the, you know, so then you have to get, you, what you do is you do a talk every week. And so my first two years of sobriety, I was telling my story <laughs> every week. And, um, and the first time I did it, I was so afraid. I was absolutely so afraid, and, and uh, I did it at the, I remember, you know, Remember the weird stuff, right? I did it on a Sunday morning at the Harvard Square meeting. And um, my sponsor at the time, his name was Paul, he handed me a penny. He's like, here, like, hold on to this because it says in God we trust. Now, I didn't trust God. Like, like I want to be really clear about that. I didn't trust God, but I was, like, clenching the penny the whole time. I did my talk. Other people did their talk. This guy comes up to me right at the end of the meeting, and he goes, hey, honey, listen. We don't do the fifth step at the podium. You do that in person. Like, I had no clue what came out of my mouth, but a lot of stuff must have come out. And so that was kind of what I learned about in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we get to kind of share our general way here, and we get the opportunity to work with sponsors and sponsees where we get to share. what. And you know what? And if we share it up here, that's okay, too, because the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And, um, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to let you in on a secret. I actually didn't even think I was a real alcoholic for a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because, see, I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease. That's what the book says. I have a disease that lies to me. I have a disease that's cunning, baffling, and powerful. I have a disease that's going to tell me I don't have a disease, that it's okay for me to walk into the bar, that it's okay for me to, like, sit down at the bar, that it's okay for me to smell the drink. That's okay. My disease wants me out there picking up a drink or picking up a drug so I can die, period. This is a disease that kills. And we don't, you know, and when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I saw a lot of it. I would sit in a meeting like this. Chairs would fly across the meeting. People would fall out of chairs and have seizures. We would be having, I remember one time, really the when we were having the Lord's Prayer. Some guy fell out, has a seizure. One person goes down and does it, and everyone else keeps going. And it's like, because I was getting sober in downtown Boston in noon meetings where people who didn't work and people who came from the street went to meetings. And um, and this is a disease that really kills. And we, we, we sometimes we gloss over that we're like oh yeah if you go out come back in you may not get the opportunity to come back in and, and it kind of and that really um sunk in with me but i remember that um you know so i'm coming here and my boyfriend's getting sober and we were still in this back and forth thing you know we're fighting all the time and i'm in these meetings i'm like well i'm going to do it for a year i'm just i'm going to do it for a year because i need a rest i was burned out and i'm and i'm sitting in a meeting at about four months sober and this woman shares, her name's Betty, she was a friend of mine, and um, Betty was on a lot of um, psych meds, and um, so sometimes she would go on and on, and they would cut her off in the meetings, but what Betty was sharing about that day was she raised her hand, she's like, hey, you know, you get up, and you say, you know, I'm a grateful alcoholic, and I don't understand it, because I feel like nobody's home. And she was, like, howling it, like, nobody's home, and I'm in so much pain, and you don't understand me, and nobody's home. And, you know, in that moment, I understood what Betty was saying. Because when I walked through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was empty inside, and there was nobody home. And when I looked in the mirror, I had a hard time looking at myself. You know, like when we go, you know, we go home and we look at ourselves in the mirror. I mean, think about it. Go home tonight and, like, look at yourself a long time in the mirror. And, like, you see a person, and then you don't see a person. You look right through, and then sometimes you look out. Well, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, when I looked in the mirror, there wasn't much there. And I understood Betty, and that's the day that I believe that I caught the disease of alcoholism. Four months sober. I had to put down a drink, and I had to put down a drug, and I had to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had to hear you tell me what was going on inside of me. And when you talked about joy, and you talked about anger, and you talked about resentment, and you talked about happiness, I didn't understand that, but I understood what it felt like to be empty in nobody's home. That I understood. And so that's when I got the disease of alcoholism. And, you know, and I just kept talking my way through it. And I kept showing up at meetings. Um, I remember when I got my one-year cake, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't raise my hand to get a chip till I was nine months sober because I, you know, 
Because remember, I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease. Like, I caught it that moment, and then I walked out. I'm like, no, I really don't have that disease. I'm not like any of them. I'm young. I mean, I was still young in the meeting. Today, we have lots of young people. I, I got sober when I was 21 years old. I was still pretty young in a lot of meetings. I'm like, oh, no, I'm too young, and that doesn't happen to me. You know, all the stuff, all the lies that the disease tells us. And so I was still, like, playing that game, but I didn't drink no matter what. I just didn't pick up a drink or a drug no matter what. And um and I kept coming back. So I um I did all that. I got you know, I stayed sober, which was a gift. I started working the steps my first year. I don't recommend this. I worked the first three steps um the best I could. And then the second year I started working my fourth and my fifth step. Uh and then I was doing um and then I moved from Boston. So I moved, like I did the fourth step, which took me forever. I did the fifth step with my sponsor, Michael, and then I ended up moving away from Boston because I needed to, um, I needed to get away from my boyfriend, Eddie. We were back and forth and, um, he kept going out. He couldn't stay clean and sober. And so he would keep going out and, and I was really trying to stay sober and, um, and was staying sober. And I, I, I was as addicted to him, I believe, as I was to drugs and alcohol and so I did a geographic sober, two years sober, which worked for me. Um, and I moved away and I went to Chicago. And my dad had lived in Chicago. So, you know, I get on, I remember very distinctly getting on the plane. And I'm getting on the plane. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to Chicago and I don't know anyone. Like, how am I going to stay sober? And I remember that you, you had talked to me a lot about God and I had a really hard time understanding God. And even though I worked at this point up through step five, I still didn't believe in God. I didn't trust God. I didn't know what God was. God to me was a God that I learned about when I was a kid that was a male figure in some sky in some other dimension that was like either was, we were either good or we were bad, you know? And, um, and that I had a real hard time with that. And so I get on the plane to come to, to, to move from Boston to Chicago I'm like, how am I going to stay sober? And all of a sudden, I started like seeing this flood of all the faces and all the people and all the slogans and all the things that he taught me and the times when we went out for coffee. And I'm like, that's what I started to internalize that was going to keep me sober was the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and all those things that you had taught me. And so I land in Chicago and I started going to meetings. I started going to a place called the Mustard Seed um, in downtown Chicago. It was cool. And um, I went to those meetings and... Uh, and then I, then I came out and, you know, I had an interesting, so when I go to Chicago, I'm like, I had been hanging out with a lot of gay, I got sober in gay men's AA in Boston because my boyfriend was what he was and all my friends were, a lot of them were gay men. And, um, and I was really grateful to the meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, because there were some men that were closed, there were some meetings that were closed to gay people and they actually made an exception for me, um. They did a group conscious and made an exception for me to come to the meeting because it was the only place that I felt safe that I could go. And I'm so grateful to the, the gay men's community for doing that. And so I go to Chicago and I'm like, I'm going to like hang out with straight people because that's what I am. So I started hanging out with straight people and like four months later I had a girlfriend, right? <laughs> like, what is that about? <laughs> I don't get what that's about a lot of times. So I get this girlfriend and you know, unfortunately for me, and this is sad for me, is... Um, a lot of my straight friends stopped talking to me with that. Like, I, it was it was, it was, was surprising for me. But, you know, I walked through it. I mean, what do we do? We don't drink or drug no matter what, and we follow our heart. I mean, that's what, you know, my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me. So I followed my heart. I got this girlfriend. You know, it, it was not um, a, a stable relationship by any means. Um, and so we, so I came out, and I, I did that. I got a sponsor, um, and I, we, I walked through the rest of the steps. So I spent three years in Chicago, and I walked through steps. Um, I, I was on step six and seven at that point. So I got a sponsor, and then we started working through steps six and seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. And so I did all that for my next three years in Chicago, and um, and that was a great experience. So then I was living in Chicago, and. Um, I had this experience, so I was living there, and my dad was there, and it was a time that I got to, to really meet my father again as an adult, and start, develop a little bit of a relationship with him, and we worked together for a little while, and that didn't work out so well, and then I moved into one of, um, an apartment that he owned, and that didn't work out so well, and he ended up um, suing me, 
And so we didn't talk for a couple years. So that was, you know, like, and, and my first, fourth, and fifth step, all about my parents, right? All about my parents. Like, I am who I am, and it's all their fault. And I feel like this, and it's all their fault. And I'm messed up, and it's all their fault. Like, it was like parent number one, dump, 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 vomit. Parent number two, vomit, vomit, vomit. You know, like, all the stuff around the parents. So then I, like, think, you know, there I am, three to five years sober, like, trying to do this stuff with my dad. We end up, we end up in court. Like, it didn't go real well. <laughs> so, anyway, by that time, I was on another relationship. Um, the girlfriend and I decided to move across the country to California. We were going to Hollywood. And um, so we, <laughs> and so we, get in a, we rented a U-Haul or whatever you rent, and we drove to California, and, um, and I ended up in Laguna Beach. And Laguna Beach was just a great town. And I ended up there at about five years sober. When I got there, six months, that I was there for six weeks, and my girlfriend started having an affair. And, um, and I just, like, I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me. I was five years, just over five years sober. I was in a town where I didn't have a support system. And my girlfriend was having an affair. And, um, and I remember very clearly that... One and I, I went. I mean, I went really deep and dark, and I, and I didn't pick up a drink or a drug, no matter what, because that is the only rule that I needed to follow in Alcoholics Anonymous to come back tomorrow. And so I didn't do that. And I found myself one night driving down. It's this canyon road, and it winds like this, and it's real dark. It's called Laguna Canyon Road, and I had this very like out of literally out of body experience and I'm driving down the road and I like floated up to the ceiling and I saw myself driving and I was on the wrong side of the road and I said you need to get back in your body you need to get the car on the right side of the road you need to drive home to take care of yourself and when I got home and I was thinking about it um I realized something that you had taught me in Alcoholics Anonymous which was this I needed to get a relationship with a power greater than myself or I was going to die. And I was either going to die sober or I was going to pick up a drink or a drug again because I didn't have that relationship with a higher power. And I had worked all the steps, but it wasn't internalized. And so from that point, at five and a half years sober, you know, the relationship took me to my knees. From that point, I started trying to meditate every morning, and I started writing letters to God. And I would sit in that chair to meditate every morning. I had this white chair that rocked. It was nice. It was a nice chair to sit in. And I would sit for like 15 minutes, and I'm going to tell you, the amount of meditation I got, maybe 15 seconds. You know what I mean? Like, what? Because, and then what I learned is like today, like, hey, it's meditation. It's like sitting down and making a deliberate and intentional choice to have a communication with a power greater than myself. And so that was very much what that was. So then, you know, as I've gotten more sober, I, I don't have to judge myself as harshly. I mean, it's one of the beautiful gifts of sobriety. And so I started doing that, and I started writing letters to God. Dear God, fuck you. I don't know who you are, and my life is messed up. You know, dear God, I can't even use that word. Dear universe, dear whatever you are. And I did that for five years. I wrote letters to God for five years in my sobriety, really regularly. And when I was about 10 years sober, I kind of was, you know, doing my life sober. And I looked around and, like, I, I had, I was making money. Not, you know, I was, like, had a job. I was making enough money to pay my bills. I had friends. I developed some new activities. Like, I was mountain biking and dancing and all this stuff. And I'm like, and I looked around. I'm like, wow, my life is really full. My life, my, my cup is full. It was no longer half empty. And, um, and my whole orientation to life changed because after five years of writing letters to this God, I had a relationship with it. It's like real easy. Like you get a relationship with it when you write letters every day. <laughs> and, um, and the greatest part about getting a relationship with God is that once I had the relationship, now it's like evolved and it's, it's really just in an incredible journey. And, um, and you know, through the, the evolution of my relationship with, with, with it. And, um, and so that was, you know, the first big, like, spirit, huge, huge spiritual um, experience I had with God. When I was 17 years sober, I discovered that I had hepatitis C, which is a direct result of my using. And, um, and I went on a treatment plan, and it was a year. And I had to give myself an injection three times a week. It made me real sick. And I, and I had to stop working for almost a year. And, um, and it made me feel like every day I had the flu. And so I'm 17 years sober. 
I'm feeling like every single day I had a horrible flu. And, um, and I'm sitting in this house. I was with a different, you know, <laughs> relationships are funny. I was with a different girlfriend at this point, you know, in and out of the relationships. It's kind of hard. Hopefully no more I'm married now. <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so I'm, and my girlfriend at the time was having an affair and I had been on this, these meds for like nine months and I lost a lot of weight. Half of my hair was out, like my skin hurt. I was in, you know, it just was so sick. And, um, and I had all these complications. I was in a, extreme amount of physical pain and I found myself literally on the floor in my house at like 17 or 18 years sober fetal screaming just crying and screaming wondering how I was going to have the strength to get up and take one more step and to do it sober I didn't know how I was going to do it and it was in that moment while I was on the floor that for the first time in my sobriety I remember praying I call it praying from God instead of to God and what I discovered and I always get choked up about this. What I discovered is that, you know, we say that, you know, we talk about courage here and we talk about acceptance and we talk about um, just being able to have, you know, being able to have courage, I guess, is um, the way I describe it. And I'm on the floor and I realized that that existed within me. It was there the whole time. I thought it was out there. Like, I'm like praying to this thing out there and I realized that when I when I allowed myself to be open, it really was just inside of me. And close, I mean, we can all we've all had the days where we've had to call on our courage. And that day, I really called on my courage, and it was a day that it changed my orientation around what I was capable of and the way that I could live. And I got that because I worked the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got to have that experience. Um, one of the other great gifts of of the program is that. Um, is what we talked about, and you talked about it, is that we get to um, have an amend. So, you know, I talked to you about how my first four step was all about my parents, like they were so awful. Well, when I turned 20 years sober, I gave myself a gift, and I decided that I was going to tell each of my parents every time I talked to them that I loved them. Now, my parents never said to me, I love you. You know, like some families are like, hey, I love you, I love you, I love you. Never in my family. I never heard it. I never heard it. And I thought, hey, I want that. I want that. And so, you know how I got it? Is I start to give it. Like, if I come from God, if I come from that place, that, so, that inner source, if I give it, I can get it back. Like, that's what happens for me. So, at 20 years sober, I gave myself a gift, and I started calling. Every time I talked to my parents, I would say, I love you. I freaked both of my parents out. My mother would get to her, she's like, oh, yeah, 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 I love you too, God. And like, I got the phone, right? And, um, and then my dad never told me, never told me once that he loved me um, he, in those exact words because he didn't have the capability. But I want to tell you what happened for me when I did that. I got to, you know, we talk about it in the ninth step, we get to walk through the arch. I walked through the arch the day that I started telling my parents I love you when I hung up the phone. Because even though I didn't necessarily, and I'm still working on it with my mother, I acted as if, and I'm going to tell you, acting as if does make a difference. And I tell her every time I talk to her that I love her, and my heart softens every time I talk about it. Every time I get to say that to her, my heart softens a little bit more. And my dad, at the time when I started telling him, my dad had Parkinson's disease. And I got to be there and walk with him his last seven years on the planet. And, you know, that, and I got to tell him that I loved him. For those last, for his last five years, I got to look at him in his eyes and say, I love you. And he was the source of all my problems when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to say, I love you. I got to walk through the heart arch and, and have a liberation that I've never known. And we talk about it in Alcoholics Anonymous. We talk about freedom, and it's the freedom from bondage of self, like, oh my God, this is what you're going to think of, about me. And it's the freedom from all those resentments that keep us being that victim, that keep us in that place where we can't allow ourselves to express everything and every everything that we are. And so that was a huge, huge gift in Alcoholics Anonymous. I also want to tell you, and I've talked about this, that um, the disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And when I was 27 years sober, I went to see a friend of mine. Um, she, a very dear friend of mine. She lives on an island off of Italy. It's called Sardinia. Like, so it's like out in the middle of Delaware, where... And I'm visiting her. We connected, you know, we reconnected on Facebook. It's like, well, my childhood friend, let's go. And so she lives, you know, she, they have olive trees and a house over the Mediterranean. I mean, it couldn't be more beautiful. I'm sitting there. And her husband, like, is a, is, is a hash head. 
like they get all their hash from Africa. She's like, yeah, you got to try this. I'm like, I don't, I don't do that. And so they would sit around at night, like we'd have all the pasta at 9 o'clock at night, blah, blah, blah. They sent the kids to bed and the day start smoking hash. I'm like, I can't be here. They're like, come on, just have like one hit. And do you know that I was sitting there at 27 years sober, and I, I, I always have been active in Alcoholics Anonymous, always. Um, and I, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden my head started saying, you're halfway around the world who would know. You're halfway around the world. Why don't you just take one hit? You're halfway around the world. You never liked hash and pot anyway. It wasn't your drug of choice. Just do it. And I started to sweat and I started to shake. And all of a sudden I started seeing like this, the face of my sponsor. I'm like, yeah, but I'd have to tell my sponsor. Could I really keep that secret? And, um, and I got up and I said, I got to go to my bedroom. Because what I knew how to do was just like I had to remove myself from the danger zone. And I, and I got to understand in that moment that this disease truly, truly is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And because I come to meetings, and because I had sponsees and sponsors, and because I read the book, and because I share, and because I have fellowship, I had the strength and courage in that moment to remove myself from the situation and not pick up a drink or a drug no matter what. And I got to come back tomorrow and tell you about it. And, um, and, that's, and that's the gift about Clause Zones. So it's been um, about 10 years since then when I was... Um, 50 years old, so seven years ago, I uh, I was living down in Southern California still, and my business fell apart in the recession. My relationship of 10 years fell apart, and I needed to start um, working again, uh, and I didn't want to compete with my former um, business partner. So I came up to San Francisco, and I moved up here. At th- I moved up here two months before my 30-year AA birthday, and... Uh, I started my life again, basically. At 30, I started my life in San Francisco. And I'm going to tell you, it was scary. But, you know, the greatest part is, like, we get to go to meetings and, and, and you know, and I would, and so I did what you taught me to do when I first came in. Like, I went to this meeting. I live in Mill Valley, so I went to this meeting called The Cabin, and I volunteered to, like, clean the kitchen. And I did the fellowship after, even though I didn't want to. Like, I got breakfast with everyone after the 7 a.m. meeting, and I didn't want to be there, but I just made myself go, because that's what you taught me to do when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You taught me to come here and and raise my hand and be of service. And so I started doing that, and I started getting the commitment in the meetings, and I I developed some friends, and then... um, and then I ran into some friends in San Francisco that I had known from Southern California. And I and I was here for about two and a half years, and I just was doing my job and doing my life. And then through some friends, I met the person who's now my wife. Um, we got married three years ago. I never thought I was going to walk down an aisle. I got a big white dress, and I walked down the aisle and got married. You know, I got to, like, we get to live our full life when we get sober, right? So now I'm married, and um, and I'm and. You know, when we came, I, we came up here, and there's like, I have a tribe. I have a tribe again because that's how Alcoholics Anonymous works. I have a tribe. So, you know, what the way I I continue to stay sober today is by doing this. I focus on ten, eleven, and twelve, and I'm very, very um, deliberate about still continuing to spend meditation time. And the interesting thing about meditation, and I was kind of laughing about it before, is you know, meditation is whatever we want it to be. The point for me is that I sit down every morning and I have the intention to sit and have a time where I think about or I, I, I connect with that power for me that's that's greater than myself or I connect with my inner source or I connect with whatever I connect with. And, um, and I have days where it just isn't going real well. It's like, you know, my head's off and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been, you know, doing all the crazy thinking for 10 minutes and then I come back and I do all the crazy things, and I'm like, and I come back one more time, I'm like, okay, that's what it's going to be today. That's what it's going to be today. That's all it's going to be today. But you know what? I don't pick up the drink, and I don't pick up the drug, and I take the action. Because my, my sponsor, Patio, who um, actually passed away a couple of months ago, um, used to always tell me, she always used to say, right thinking follows right action. This is an action program. Right thinking follows right action. If I don't want to go to the meeting and I'm because I don't like feel like anyone's seeing me because I've been feeling down, go to the friggin' meeting and sit in the chair. Take the right action. You know, if I don't feel like showing up to the fellowship afterwards because you know I'm not feeling whatever and I haven't been socializing a lot, 
go to the fellowship afterwards, take the right action. Um, when I first got sober, if I didn't feel like going to the dance, I went to the sober dance and I pretended I was having fun. And you know what? One day I figured out I was having fun. Right thinking follows right action. And so I do that today. I, and I, I practice the meditation every day. And when I'm, when I feel like I've screwed up, which I do a lot because I'm human and sometimes I get irritated, agitated, whatever, um, and I bark at someone, you know, I get, I have the opportunity to say I'm sorry and like this is where I'm wrong. And, you know, and I manage people at work and, and most of the time I'm great and sometimes I'm not great and I get to tell them, hey, I'm sorry, this is where I messed up. And, you know, it's really amazing, um, what happens when we get to authentically tell people like, hey, this, you know, I didn't mean to do this. Like, it's amazing the kind of response that I get. And then I also get to um, practice the principles in all my affairs and and hope to share my story with another alcoholic. And I have um, two sponsees that I work with very closely today, and the truth is they keep me sober. You know, I get to spend time reading the book with them every week, and they keep me sober. I make the, com- you know, I make the commitment. It's a commitment for me, and it's my, it's my sobriety, and they keep me sober. And I get to be... Um, I get to live the principles and the promises that have been given to me. And, you know, people look at that, they're like, wow, like that's, you know, that's cool. And so, you know, this is the perfect balance and the perfect thing that I've chased my whole life. And, um, and life happens, but the, the, the tools that you have given me um, to be able to live my life just fill my heart and I, I wake up and I am truly, and I know that I'm gifted and I know that I'm graced with, um, that, uh, you know, I have a very optimistic outlook on life and I get to wake up every day and greet the day with love in my heart. Or it's the days I don't feel like that. I say it, I greet the day with love in my heart. Um, I I greet the day with love in my heart. And, um, and, and, um, and I always say, you know, in the infinity of life where I am, everything is perfect, whole and complete because I can't, I I have to accept the things I cannot change. Like whatever's there is there, you know. And uh, and I and I have my things. Like we all have our things. And whatever your things are, they're the perfect things for you. As if you're sitting here tonight, right? Because you're here. And um, and so I get to practice those things, and I get to take those out in the world, and I get to be a person that I'm really proud of. And so when I go home tonight and I look in the mirror, there's going to be somebody home. When I look in the mirror tonight and I look at myself, there's somebody home, and that somebody is the person that you've made me, and I am so very grateful for that. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.